Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 335, Pastor Jeff Dibel's Christ Before Creeds. Pastor Jeff Dibel grew up in the Australian Churches of Christ. He has been in full-time Christian service for more than 40 years, with roles as state youth and camping director, Christian education and resource development, college lecturer, and local church ministry as senior pastor and church planter. He's also served as a chaplain in professional sports and in the military in Australia. He lives in Sydney with his wife, Pam. They have three grown sons and six grandchildren. Today, Pastor Dibel is with me to talk about his excellent new introductory level book, which evaluates small c Catholic traditions in light of scripture. Published by LHIM, Living Hope International Ministries, the book is entitled Christ Before Creeds, Rediscovering the Jesus of History. If you've been meaning to look into this dispute about whether or not any doctrine of a triune God is actually taught in Scripture, this is a great place to start. Even if you're not willing to reconsider your own theology, it's a great book by which to understand that friend or close family member who has recently told you that while they remain a Christian, they're no longer a Trinitarian Christian. Pastor Dibel, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Thank you, Dial. Pastor Dibel, as you relate in the book, you lived through the nightmare of having someone close to you unexpectedly go heretical. Can you tell us what that was like? Yeah, sure, Dial. Well, it really came out of the blue um, without any kind of like forewarning. My older brother just announced one day that he no longer believed in the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, which really, for me, was quite a shock. It didn't actually initially bother me too much because, you know, the Trinity was always a bit of a confusing or esoteric theology anyway, and, you know, people could speculate about it a bit. But I think what really rattled me was when he started unpacking what that meant. And I remember the day he said that he believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but not God the Son. Mm. And look, I had this visceral reaction. I literally felt sick. I thought, how could anyone be a Christian and not believe that Jesus was God? And that's when I really thought he'd gone heretical. That's when I thought he'd kind of, you know, crossed over to the dark side, so to speak. Mm. In fact, I remember when he was talking about writing a book about it, I suggested that he write it under a a pseudonym. And the name I suggested was Harry Tickle. (laughs) <laughs> Harry Tickle, as in heretical. <laughs> in fact, I started calling him Harry. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, dear. That's interesting. You call it a visceral reaction. I mean, there is a tradition of either Jesus is God or you just think he's a great human teacher. You know, maybe he's peers with Muhammad or the Buddha or something. And to say he's not God, I mean, that's just like a vicious assault upon his character and status. I mean, like, didn't he say he was God? I mean, you must have feared like he was in the grip of a cult or something. Yeah, I I just, it just threw me. It just, you know, at the time I was just totally discombobulated. I couldn't believe it, that he was actually saying those words. Yeah, that's interesting too, that it wasn't the Trinity so much, but it was really the deity of Christ that sort of set off the warning bells for you. I think that's very common with evangelical Christians, certainly in America. Mm, yeah, That one cuts much closer. Trinity, well, nobody really understands that, but I mean, come on, Jesus is God, right? Like everybody, everybody yeah. thinks that. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And, and I think the Trinity's kind of a doctrine that kind of is used to shore up, you know, that Christology. That was the big bone of contention back in, you know, when the, when the creeds were first formed. You know, if Jesus is God, then then you need a theology that's going to have to support that. And yeah, my experience is that a lot of evangelicals in America sort of think like this: that well, everybody thinks the Father's God, and then the Son's God, and the Trinity. That's just when you add that the Holy Spirit's God. Hmm. That's not right because 
the Trinity is belief in a tripersonal God. And there were people saying that in some sense Christ was divine a good while before they were talking about a triune God. So mm, there really are two different issues, especially when you look at it historically. Mm. The brother goes wild. Yep. Did that induce you to get into a bunch of arguments with him or did you more avoid it? That's what actually, yes, sparked debate. You know, I have to be honest and say if it was anyone other than my brother who had kind of said what he said, I would have just dismissed them out of hand. You know, I would have just labelled them a heretic and moved on. Mm. But, I mean, I knew my brother's sincere faith. I knew his love of, you know, the scriptures and his knowledge and that he always sought the truth. So it did give me at least a willingness to hear him out. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it did pique my interest a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, Pastor Dybul, near the beginning of this book, Christ Before Creeds, you have a very sensitive and insightful discussion of why many Christians are just very reluctant to re-examine their views about the Trinity. You write, In hindsight, I believe the emotional and relational dimensions were what I struggled with the most. And then you go on to point out the many reasons people have for not reopening this issue of the Trinity, namely that it's confusing, it's time-consuming, it's destabilizing, it seems like it's impractical and isolating and divisive. So how did you find the motivation to really dig into the issue yourself? Yeah, well, because I said if it was, wasn't my brother, I, I probably wouldn't have had that motivation. But look, what I think I say there, and, and you've just quoted, is I think very true. Um, there's a whole lot of you know emotional and psychological reasons uh, behind why this is a bit of a no-go zone for people. I think, firstly, it has some cultic associations, at least here in Australia. Mm-hmm. You know, only people like the Mormons or the JWs think that Jesus isn't God, and they're not considered as genuine Christians. So it kind of has that association. I think it undermines people's credibility structures you know maybe they've never looked into it personally but the church they attend or their minister or maybe some books they've read or other christians believe it so therefore it must be true but to deny it would be to deny their heritage it would actually in a Mm. sense be like betraying people they trust and love yeah Um, Yeah. it, it really shakes you know the very foundations of their faith And look, it is very destabilizing. I remember, you know, my own reactions. I remember thinking, I was so sure, I was so confident of who I thought Jesus was, that if that's not right, and the truth has somehow kind of been withheld from me, then what else is open, you know, to question? What can I really be sure of? I mean, I really went through quite a crisis of faith. It's so destabilizing. So I think there's all these emotional, these spiritual dimensions. It's not just a head thing. People have been worshipping Jesus as God. They've been seeing him, praying to him, kind of relating to him as God. Mm -hmm. So to now suggest that he's otherwise or someone different somehow, it really is kind of threatening to undermine their whole relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, it does get very confusing. People have said to me, look, you know, theologians have been talking and debating about this for centuries. I mean, what hope have I ever got of trying to understand this? Yeah. And look, it is very isolating too. I mean, I, you know, it can cost you dearly in terms of friends or acceptance by other Christians, like for myself and for pastors or full-time Christian workers, you know, your reputation and even your income is at stake. So, yeah, look, there's a whole bunch of you know, more psychological and emotional and even spiritual reasons. It's not just an intellectual issue. Yeah, I think it strikes people as sort of like a conspiracy theory, you know. You know what's the mm. chance that all these learned great men could be wrong for so long? And now, now my, you know, my brother comes along and says, I know better than those guys. Like, who does he think he yeah. is, you know? Yeah. I do think that when you hold a minority report view, then that does put a burden of proof on you in a sense. I think non-Trinitarian Christians really need to shoulder that and you know show how it has been throughout Christian history a minority view. And the reason why it keeps coming up over and over again is because it fits so well with the Bible. 
Mm -hmm. You know, when everybody else has all these reasons not to go back to it, it just keeps popping up over and over again. Mm -hmm. And the, the identity thing, you know, that it's part of our heritage and our identity You'll notice that a lot of apologists, they like to introduce the topic by saying, you know, we Christians think mm. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And other ones I've noticed, they don't really like to entertain Christian dissent on this topic. They like to cast it as, well, those Muslim people go around insulting this precious truth, but all we Christians know that this is right. So yeah, it's been made the basis of Christian unity, you know? If a person has sort of what are considered controversial views about Genesis or free will and divine providence or other theological matters, they'll sometimes say, well, yeah, but at least I agree about the Trinity. Mm, yeah, That's the common denominator. It's part of small c Catholic tradition to sort of say, we can have differences about when Easter is, but not this. Like, this is the one thing there can't be differences about. In fact, I've even, you know, heard people describe it as this is the central and defining doctrine of Christianity. This is the big one. But just going back to, I was just thinking, you know, your question about the motivation to open this can of worms. You know, I believe one thing that I did have in my favour that many don't is that I was brought up in what's called the restoration movement. Mm -hmm. It's called Churches of Christ over here in Australia. I think there's a few different iterations in, in the US. But the tradition I grew up did give me this freedom to examine the scriptures and to come to your own opinion. They had certain catch cries or slogans that were their kind of core values, um, things like, you know, no creed but Christ, no mm -hmm. book but the Bible. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. Bible things by Bible names. We're Christians only, not the only Christians. Mm -hmm. and, and even some of the forefathers of our movement, you know, weren't actually Orthodox Trinitarians, you know, like Barton Stone or, mm -hmm. or Alexander Campbell. And so that heritage was actually very helpful for me. You know, I can imagine that other people who were brought up in a different tradition where the authority of the priest or the church, you know, the authority of tradition or even creedal statements, where they're really held in high regard, you know, it would be even more difficult for them. But at least I had a heritage where there was a freedom given for people to explore truth for themselves in the scriptures. And I mm -hmm. think that was very helpful for me. That's a really good point. I mean, these are historically, I would call them the more Protestant Protestants. <laughs> like <they're, laughs> yeah. They have changed more things than the Lutherans and Calvinists and others. They have a lot in common with what historians call the Radical Reformation in the 15, 16, 1700s. And in the 1800s, I think the Church of Christ was born in America, right? And they were weary of not only state churches and government, you know, oppression of religion, but I think they were really kind of worn out by all of the history of odium theologicum, the heated theological disputes about predestination and church government and baptism and yeah. lots of other things. Yeah, It was a back to the Bible and back to the basics movement. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It's a gradation, you know, you have like the Lutherans and the Anglicans that are the most Catholic of the Protestants. And then there's a large body of kind of Baptisty type Protestants in America, which are pretty Bible oriented, really. Like they don't get up and say the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed. Mm. But then you're talking about even more intent on kind of sticking with the Bible and really treating that like it's sufficient. Yeah. Sort of exactly. on the far the farther end of the scale. I've noticed that for educated people that, you know, get a PhD or get a master's at the seminary, there's a real allure of going more Catholic. They just become very enamored of mm. the great tradition and now they think Augustine and Aquinas are just like the coolest guys. My view's always been much more mixed than that. Like I see the good things in the tradition, but being trained as a philosopher, I also know that sometimes people like Augustine and Aquinas are full of baloney and not very good at philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> They're just human. They're just human beings. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And look, unfortunately, even in my tradition, you know, even I say it's a, this real radical back to basics, back to the Bible, you know, no creedal thing. 
there is certainly a tendency even within our tradition to want to move to you know more definitive we don't call them creeds but statements of faith Mm -hmm. and now churches each have their statement of faith and you have to believe that you know or otherwise you're seen as outside you know outside the box so look there's even that tendency even within my tradition you know to get a bit more creedal it's unfortunate In this country, there are Baptist theologians who are pushing as hard as they can to just make basically evangelicalism a lot more Catholic. Like Mm. they're like, "Oh man, why why are we so far on this fringe?" And you know, they're not even close to being restorationists. But yeah, again, there's lots of good things in the traditions, but there's so many problems too, and they don't seem to be as interested in exploring those. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Pastor Diebold discusses what it was that pushed him over the edge from being a Trinitarian Christian to being a non-Trinitarian Christian. So you ended up changing from being Trinitarian in your understanding of the Bible to being non-Trinitarian. How long did that shift take you? The whole journey, like from becoming or or from being a fully committed Trinitarian to a fully committed non-Trinitarian, that whole journey would have taken, I reckon, about 12 years. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I guess not everyone's as pig-headed as I was, but, but it did take me quite a while. And um, I think, you know, sometimes we can get very impatient with Trinitarians. You know, once we get it, once we kind of see the light, we sort of can't understand why others don't see it too, and we can get become a bit impatient. But, yeah, oftentimes, a bit like a person becoming a Christian, you know, sometimes that journey does take a while, you know, plant a few seeds and then a bit further on something else happens. And, and once you've got an idea in your head, it's amazing once you're stuck in a paradigm, how difficult it is mm-hmm. to kind of get out of it. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, the other day I came across a great quote and I knew I was going to be talking to you today, so I actually wrote it down and it's by Leo Tolstoy. He said, the most difficult subjects can be explained to the most slow-witted man if he's not formed by any idea already. But the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he's firmly persuaded that he knows already, without a shadow of a doubt, what is laid before him. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of expresses to me the resistance that we inherently have when we already have, you know, our presuppositions in place and our paradigm how re- resistant we are when new information comes along. It's very difficult. And look, there is a kind of like a, a deconstruction that is really massive for Trinitarians. It was for me anyway. Mm-hmm. It, it's really anxiety producing. And yeah. that's kind of where I try to be sensitive in my book. It's not about winning the argument. It's really about just sowing some seeds, building bridges of awareness and acceptance and kind of creating the right atmosphere for people to be able to engage in respectful conversations around this. Did you go through certain stages in this? Was it one step forward, two steps back? Did you ever go back and forth? I'm aware that there are some people who are exposed to non-Trinitarian Christian arguments, and they sort of digest a little bit of them, and then they zoom right around and they're like five times more Trinitarian than they were before. Mm. I'm not sure I understand this phenomenon. Maybe there's more than one reason for it, but were you just very plodding and methodical and just kept kind of unraveling more and more traditional misunderstandings? I think for me it was, you know, a situation where I sort of listened, but then, you know, I had people give me books when I started to ask questions or started to talk with them about my questions on Trinitarianism and 
and how I was beginning to question some of those, you know, passages of scripture. And they would give me another book. They'd say, well, look, read this book. This will explain it all. So then I'd read that book. Say, okay, well, yeah, okay. So it was this kind of backwards and forward. Yes, but what about? Okay, but then there's this. And, you know, I wasn't in a rush. Yeah, it was just weighing up the arguments and the, and the points of view and trying to, you know, just come to a settled and committed position eventually. Mm-hmm. I was very slow as well and dragging my feet, you know, being a PhD, I, I knew how uncool it was to not be a Trinitarian. You know, I was part of the Society of Christian Philosophers. I was so conservative that I had the canon within the canon, the traditional text that you're supposed to appeal to to supposedly derive the Trinity from the Bible. And I wasn't going to switch until I had a non-arbitrary, independently plausible way to understand every single one of those passages. Mm. So that took a long time because some of those passages are quite hard Mm. and there's a big literature on them and they're hard for all kinds of different reasons. But I think I was ignoring, it took years for a point like this to sink in. If they believed that God was the Trinity, they would have a word or phrase to refer to the Trinity. Hmm. But they don't. You know, they, they talk about the Father, they talk about God, and that's always just one of the divine persons, almost hmm. always the Father. So evidential points like that, I think, took a long time to soak into my mind because I was so... You know, what about Philippians 2? What about John 1? What about Colossians 1? What about John 8, 58? Like that was, I had that mindset, I guess, for my exposure to apologetics over many years. Were you much exposed to apologetics or more just to other Christian material? Yeah, I was exposed to that. And look, I can identify with what you're saying because, you know, there's a sense in which I have a bit of a logical mind that wants to kind of put all the ducks in a row and make sure it all works out, you know, just very neatly and, and properly. Actually, the thing that got me across the line wasn't an argument. Mm-hmm. I just decided one day, why don't I read the New Testament, but not from a, a Trinitarian paradigm? What if I just assume that uh, I'm reading it from a non-Trinitarian paradigm, as you know, a first century Jew from their cultural background would be reading it? Mm-hmm. And I read it with, I guess, a different set of glasses on, a different perspective. And it all just started to make a whole lot more sense. Yeah, Um, yeah. You know, I didn't have to do these kind of mental backflips and gymnastics as I came across it. It just read a whole lot more simply, plainly, and coherently. And that was the thing that actually convinced me in the end. Mm. Interesting. It's hard to get past that proof texting mindset, but... When you come Mm. at it more objectively, like it just doesn't even sound Trinitarian 99% of the time. Mm. The only time it even sounds Trinitarian is those few passages when it mentions Father, Son, and Spirit in close proximity. Mm. Mm. But that's very rare, right? It just goes around calling the Father God all the time. Mm. And that doesn't sound Trinitarian. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Another thing I've noticed in the tradition is... Ever since we've had the word Trinity, which goes back to about the year 180, it can just be a plural referring term for God, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God, whatever those are. Mm. And so then in that sense, it doesn't presuppose a triune God. And I find Mm. that theologians still use it very often in that sense. Then later Mm. on in the end of the 300s, it comes to mean the triune God. So in the realm of theology, and you say God is Trinity, you mean God is the three of them together. But then theologians will, or biblical scholars will say, yeah, the, the New Testament's got the Trinity all over it. Well, but the triune God is never mentioned once. But yeah, the three of them, whatever those are, mm-hmm. the Father, Son, and Spirit, yeah, that's all over it, sure. Mm-hmm. But it's just God, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God. Mm-hmm. When someone puts it that way, come on, the Trinity's just all over the place. Well, in that sense, it is. Mm. But then, you know, they kind of sneak in the other meaning <laughs> when you're not looking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's just, it's just one of many confusions that the theologians aren't necessarily very much help in all of this. I remember an apologist or a theologian telling me that when you see the word God, you know, theos in the New Testament or Elohim or a couple other words in the Old Testament, when you see mm. a word that we translate as God, Unless the context demands one of the three persons, you should assume that it means the Trinity. 
<laughs> and then, you know, eventually I found out by reading textual scholars that that's just dead wrong. Like mm. it doesn't even say that in the, in the lexicons, you know? Mm. So what, what I was told was just wrong. What the apologists are saying is one thing. What the systematic theologians are saying is another and then what the actual kind of historically concerned textual scholar say is yet another thing. Yes, yes. It's amazing just the amount of misinformation that is put out there. I remember I um, was listening to one Trinitarian theologian make you know, the very clear statement that the reason the early Christian church in the, in the first century, the reason they were persecuted was that they believed that Jesus was God. And I thought there is absolutely no historical evidence or biblical evidence that I'm aware of that would support yeah. that statement. Yeah. Paul says that very clearly, you know, to the Galatians, that the reason he was being persecuted was because he was seen to be not supporting the Old Testament Torah. And if you mm -hmm. go through the book of Acts, you see that the reason the Jews were persecuting was because of jealousy or because, you know, that other reasons, but never. So there was just no evidence for his statements, but anyway. That's one of those missing things, all these controversies about Jesus being God and God being the three persons. That Those missing things seem like they're really significant evidence. Sometimes people, if they're trained in apologetics, they have a knee-jerk reaction and say, oh, you can't prove a negative or you can't have an argument from silence. No, you look. My evidence for thinking that there's not a tiger in the room with me now is that I do not see a tiger in the room right now, <laughs> right? And I doubt that there's a herd of elephants in your room in Australia right now. And my evidence for that is I don't hear a bunch of elephant noises. <laughs> so when there's silence or missing, ev lacking evidence, if there would have been positive evidence, if the thing had been going on, then yeah, that silence is very, or that missing evidence is very important. Mm. So it's not right to say that you can't have an argument from silence. It's not a formal logical fallacy is one way to put it. Deep into my journey, I think I was already not Trinitarian for some time, but I realized, well, wait a second, the Jews and the Muslims have been protesting ever since there's been a doctrine of a triune God that that's not really monotheism, or it's not good monotheism or not consistent monotheism or not the Bible's monotheism or something. And then like, this just doesn't happen in early Christianity. Not only in the New Testament, it doesn't happen in the second or third centuries either, really. The paradigm shift, you know, when you're just locked into it, you're kind of going to see what you want to see. And human beings are really good at ignoring inconvenient facts that, you know, go against what we're committed to. Hmm. And as you said, there's tons of misinformation and, you know, unfortunately, sometimes that ton of misinformation is right in your study Bible footnotes. Mm. You know, I love study Bibles. I got like 10 of them, but sometimes they're terrible on this topic. One of them had a, has an essay in the back about the Trinity and how this is all over the Bible and how if you look at Jesus' baptism, boom, Trinity. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh... But. When you shift a paradigm, you're suddenly realizing that there's a better explanation for all of these things that you're looking at, mm. and then it can shift really hard on you at a certain point. Yes. It's a bit like those double pictures that sometimes you can see. There's a picture you can see two ways. You know, you can see a duck or a rabbit mm -hmm. or an old woman or a young woman. You know, when, you, when you're seeing it one way, it's very easy to not realize or appreciate there's, a, there's another way of seeing it, which makes sense. Yeah, or maybe it's like a mystery novel. You know, the, a skillful author might set up the story so that you're suspecting that this one person is the murderer. And then mm. without changing any of the facts, you learn a few additional facts, and then it totally turns upside down how you view the whole thing. And mm. the one good yeah. character that you thought was good turns out to be the baddie. <laughs> something like that. The philosophers of science call it inference to the best explanation. It's how we approach the world, what most makes sense of it. And mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, it did surprise me kind of how much sense the New Testament makes without this overlay of two natures of Christ and three persons in God. Like it has its own theology and its own Christology and it just works very well on mm -hmm. its own. Mm -hmm. They're not these primitive, confused people that, there's there's this narrative, you know, Jesus really rattled them, and they're like, 
how can this guy be God, but he's not God? And then they have to wait around for a couple hundred years until philosophy comes along and helps them out with some terms. Uh, <laughs> but they don't seem confused, you know? They're not, they're not like, how can this guy be God and not? Mm. You know, you read the, say, the preaching in the book of Acts, and, you know, he's a servant of God, a man approved to you by God through signs and wonders that God did through him. Yeah, they're just very happy with that. Mm. And I like, and also in some sense, he's God, but we find it very hard to understand. The mystery thing surprised me too, you know. Yeah. All the heavy mystery appeals. Then you look up what's actually in the New Testament, and it just means something that's been revealed that wasn't revealed before, and now everybody knows yeah. it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, mystery is one of those, you know, words that they use just to, um, as a bit of a default when, when, what they're saying doesn't really make any logical sense. And, well, it's mystery. We can't know it. And, in mm -hmm. fact, some Trinitarians even say that that's the strong point of the doctrine, you know. Well, I've had people say, well, the fact that it's so mysterious and we, our human minds can't understand it shows that it must be from God and re revealed because it wouldn't make sense to us. You know, I mean, it's just crazy mm -hmm. thinking, but mm -hmm. it's amazing how it's just used as a way to get around any inconsistencies or any just internal contradictions within within yeah. their paradigm. Yeah. Once I went to a uh, Society of Christian Philosophers meeting at Notre Dame of all places, and the mm. topic of the conference was uh, mysteries and theology. And I had been thinking about this and writing about it, you know, that, hey, are we saying this is a contradiction? Because then that, that entails that it's false, right? And or if we're just saying that it appears to be a contradiction, like, isn't that really strong evidence that it's a contradiction if it appears to be a contradiction? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. that's the only way we find contradictions is when they appear to be contradictions. So I, I had written some things, you know, considering this as a matter of evidence and a problem to be addressed. And I was really disturbed by the conference because all the main speakers and everybody else, they were just basically using mystery like an honorific term, like, oh, we got all these great mysteries, you know, they basically means just like wonderful, but hard to understand truths. Mm. And I thought it was very indulgent. You know, if, if a Zen Buddhist said, uh, the Buddha nature exists and doesn't, and you're like, well, that doesn't make sense, my friend. And then they said, yeah, but you would expect the ultimate reality to be more than our minds can handle. Like, I think we would just kind of roll our eyes. Mm. Like we're, we're very, it, it's very indulgent toward your own speculations to take what looks like an obvious downside that it seems like it's not consistent with itself and say, mm. well, yeah, but when, when it's my theory we're talking about now, that's a great thing. Mm. It's odd. Yes. And to, to even use it as proof. And just say, well, mm -hmm. look, you know, this proves that it, uh, God must have revealed it because it wouldn't make, you know, no one could conceive of such a contradiction. Yeah. I mean, that that's quite amazing to me. Yeah, they're saying it's to be expected. And so why should this be a problem at all? And mm. uh, now, I mean, you know, God says, you know, my ways are higher than your ways and so on. But I think it has to do with his plans and his timing. You could say his dispensations. Maybe that's not the right word, but his different uh, covenants and so on. But never is this brought up, you know, when it comes to just who is God or who is Jesus. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't expect to know why God has Jesus say, come back at a certain time and not another time. Mm. Wouldn't ever expect to understand that, but I wouldn't expect... God to reveal himself to the human race. And then we're stuck with, well, he's three and he's one, but if he's one, he's not three. And if he's, <laughs> yes, <laughs> if he's That's three, he's not he, one. Like, why would he foist that on us? You know, it's such a confusion. Yes. So all of that, you know, sort of mystery or the unknowingness relates to things that God has chosen not to reveal. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, that verse that says, you know, the things revealed belong to us. The things that God hasn't revealed, you know, are his. But God has clearly revealed who he is, who yeah. Jesus is. They're not in the unknowable fields that belong only to God. These are the things that God has chosen to reveal to us. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the people who helped me see this point at first were a couple of different early modern era non-Trinitarian Protestant Christians. Another thing that they did for me, and I don't know if this was a factor for you, but when I discovered that historically in modern times there had been all these non-Trinitarian Christians, 
and I could just look at their lives and read their writings, I realized that A, they're not a bunch of cultists, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. B, they obviously have this living faith in God and this love for God and for the Son of God. And a mm-hmm. lot of them, you know, just ran a very good race and left a very godly testimony. That really got my attention. And then when I eventually met some other non Trinitarian Christians in real life, which was a while, that got my attention too. And and I realized, oh, these people are just Protestants. They're just more Protestant. Mm. Mm. They disagree about other things. They have their problems like we all do. But to just scoff and say, oh, this is a bunch of cultists is just quite ignorant, I think. When the Trinity's podcast returns, I ask Pastor Dybel about the common view that it's the fourth gospel which clearly teaches the deity of Christ. Pastor Dybel, it's traditional to think that while the first three Gospels at most sort of hint or gesture at Jesus' deity, the fourth Gospel openly proclaims that Jesus is God. But I take it that you've undergone a sort of paradigm shift in how you view that Gospel, the Gospel according to John. How did that happen? Yeah, Dale, well, I guess another way people say it is that the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, They kind of focus on the humanity of Jesus, Mm -hmm. whereas John focuses more on his divinity. But I actually, you know, having re-looked at it, I don't believe the facts support that contention. I mean, firstly, John actually emphasizes Jesus' humanity, I think, even more strongly than the other Gospels. Mm -hmm. I mean, 14 times he calls Jesus a man, and that's kind of like without any any qualification. Mm -hmm. And that's more than the other three Gospels combined. So, you know, to me, if John did see Jesus as God or a God-man, it would be unlikely that he would have just allowed those statements to stand without some kind of qualification or some Mm -hmm. kind of explanation. Yeah. And look, in John's gospel, Jesus states, I think, even more clearly, even more dogmatically, that he is absolutely totally dependent on his father. A couple of times Jesus says, you know, by myself, I can do nothing. And he said, you know, once again, quite definitely in in a few places that the works that he did, in fact, his very words were not his, but from the Father. Mm. And uh, he makes some very clear statements about his inferior position. So, you know, his Father God, John 17, verse 3, comes clearly to mind, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. And again, just his identification with the disciples as his brothers, when he says to Mary after his resurrection, you know, go to my brothers, tell them I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. So, I mean, there's so much in the gospel that actually emphasizes very strongly Jesus' total humanity, that he was a man. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, you know, the first thing that kind of came to me. And I think the reason that Trinitarians appeal to John's gospel is because there are a few passages that on the surface give the impression that Jesus is God. And they're the passages that I used to use myself, you know, to prove my Trinitarian position at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's John's, you know, prologue, his introduction, you know, the word was with God, the word was God. It was, you know, towards the end, Thomas' statement, my Lord and my God. And I used to use those as my proof texts. You know, there you are, you know, it says it clearly in black and white. But, of course, when you actually look at those passages, when you examine them more closely and carefully, uh, which we won't have time to do in this this conversation, but you realise they're not all that clear cut, you know, that there's been some significant interpretation and translation bias from the Greek in a lot of our translations. And Mm. also, 
you know, they've been taken out of context, either their immediate literary context or the wider cultural context in which they were written. So, you know, I guess that was another significant point for me was actually re-examining those couple of very key uh, statements that are used by Trinitarians and realise, you know, there's, a, I think, a different way and a better way to understand what's being said there. But for me, I, I, I reckon, Dale, the clincher was um, actually John's purpose statement at the end of the book. Mm. That really, for me, was what, I guess, uh, confirmed what he was on about. You know, he says, look, there's lots of other things I could have included in this, you know, this, this account, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, by believing you may have life in his name. And that also accords with some other statements or testimonies of faith that John includes. You know, there's Nathaniel's statement early on. There's mm-hmm. Mary's uh, later on in chapter 11, uh, where they simply declare that he is the Messiah. So really, John is not saying anything beyond what the other gospel writers are saying. The thought that Jesus is God just doesn't seem to be on, on the radar, which is exactly I think what you'd expect, you know, there's no kind of first century Jew that would have had as part of their religious heritage or they wouldn't have had it as part of their theological paradigm, the thought that, you know, this Messiah was going to be Yahweh or, you know, a part of Yahweh or Mm -hmm. or even equal to Yahweh. I Mm -hmm. mean, that wouldn't have been at all a part of their thinking and just doesn't seem to be a part of John's thinking, particularly when you take into account you know, his purpose statement, uh, what he's actually writing to prove yeah. that Jesus is simply the Messiah. Yeah, and like the other Gospels, not only does he have this clear thesis statement toward the end of the book in chapter 20, but, you know, he has the good guys blurt this out several times. Mm. You know, you just can't miss it. If you heard somebody read the book, like, you would get what the main point is, but yet we come to it with all this baggage and uh, let me just add that in your book, Christ Before Creeds, you kind of focus in the in the body of the book on clear passages, and then you have an appendix A on contested passages. And I like that way of doing it. It's not right to cherry pick our favorite passages. You know, in any passage where Jesus is called God, basically any one of them, there's some problem there. Either they're not sure if the original text said that, or they're not sure how to translate it, or they're not sure how to interpret it Mm. that way. And that's really striking because you'd expect that if it's a main teaching that Jesus is God, you'd kind of expect to find it all over the place. You Mm. wouldn't expect to find it in six or eight places, and they're all problematic in this way or that way. That's quite Mm. surprising. There is good uh, material in your book where you are answering some of those questions and explaining why, no, that text isn't quite the slam dunk that you think it is. And yeah, even John 1, you have a nice coverage of that. So I appreciate that about the book. Yeah, and I think what you're saying is very true there, Dale, is that what happens is that Trinitarians and non-Trinitarians have their go-to texts, and a lot of the debate is on those fairly controversial texts. But if you're actually outside of those, look at the overall picture and tenor of what the scriptures are saying and then go to those, you know, controversial texts, fair enough. But, you know, I I do think it is a a better way to go to get the overall picture. Mm -hmm. Um, A bit like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, you you get the big picture on the box and then you can go to the individual pieces and just see how they fit into the overall picture. Oh, that's right. Once you get the easy bits in, then you can chip away at the harder edges. You know, where the whole picture is black or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah. Pastor Dybul, it's clear now from someone who's read Christ Before Creeds that your view of Jesus is rooted in your study of all of Christian scripture. And yet it's traditional to dismiss this sort of Christology as teaching that Jesus is a, quote, mere man. How do you respond to that crusty old accusation? Once again, you know, I can understand the anxiety that many Trinitarians have because, you know, I once shared that. You know, I was really defensive Mm. of any attempt, as I saw it at the time, to diminish Jesus, you know, to reduce his importance or his status. And and I thought that's what non-Trinitarians were trying to do. I now realise that, you know, that fear is 
really quite unfounded. But look, at the time, it, it was very real. You know, I, I believe my new understanding of Jesus has really only served to deepen my love and, and adoration for him. It's actually fueled my appreciation of just his total faith, his total submission, and his absolute obedience to the Father. And look, I don't see him in, in any way less worthy of, you know, my heart's affection or my life's devotion or, you know, any praise or honour or glory that uh, he deserves. So I spent actually, a, you know, a whole chapter in my book reconstructing Jesus within a non-Trinitarian framework. And uh, look, you know, I make the point that he is fully and completely human, but that doesn't mean he is just a man. He's actually infinitely more than that. You know, I mean, he's been uniquely chosen. He's uh, uniquely begotten of God. He's just loved and cherished by the Father. He's been anointed and appointed and sent. He's our Lord, our Saviour, the one who has brought and made possible our salvation. I mean, he's glorified above all others. You know, so just how wonderfully and fully he reveals and represents God and models for us, you know, the life of faith that, and love and serenity. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I could just rave on, but, yeah. you know, there is so much about him that is in no way diminished and, if anything, even more wonderfully exalted. Holding this sort of Christology opens your eyes to some New Testament themes that I think tend to get ignored because of the Absolutely. creedal traditions. Jesus is held up in the New Testament as a model of trust in God mm. and, you know, a victorious servant of God who, you know, achieved perfect obedience, basically. And, you know, somebody who brought God glory by all the things that he did. And mm. it's part of tradition to say that, you know, nature or essence is really what matters. If you rip away this precious divine nature from Jesus, like you've taken everything it's a bizarre way to look at it, though, because what would be left over is that he's God's Messiah, and then God's Messiah is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and is uh, exalted to God's right hand and put in charge of the church, and he's appointed to mm. judge. Just taking a human being who does all the things that a Messiah does in the New Testament, mm. like, how would you say, well, that's just a guy? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. That's right. And look, this debate about, I guess, the ontology, the being of Jesus, actually barely, if anything, affects the things that are most important about him. You know, his character, his life, his example, his teaching, his work of salvation on the cross, his glory. I mean, there's so much about who he is is in no way impacted by that ontology. Yeah, no, the, the old ontological obsession is really kind of strange from a New Testament perspective. Mm. It's not a subject of interest there. You know, you, mm, know, you could absolutely. rip a passage out of context, you know, the fullness of divine nature is in him. But I think that's just saying the same thing is that God was in Christ reconciling the world uh, or the Father's in me, as he says in John. Like, there mm. is no two nature teaching there. <laughs> Mm. And there's not even a single case of somebody dividing up, you know, the actions or the reactions. Oh, well, the miracle, that's the divine nature. Oh, the suffering, that's the human nature. I mean, it's just one person, mm. one Christ, one son of God, the same person that was born to Mary. Yep. But he's he's the center of it all. You know, they their mm. basic theology, in a way, is unchanged. The emphasis is different, you know, calling God Father as much as the New Testament does. but the theology is basically just the Jewish theology yep. that you see in the Old Testament. And it's all focused around Jesus because he's this amazing, stupendous Savior, mm. as it says in Philippians 2, to the glory of God the Father. So yep. it's not taking him down a notch, uh, but it is having God be his God, as it says, mm -hmm. and making him the ruler of us under God. When the Trinity's podcast returns... I asked Pastor Deibel about the social costs of his theological change.
Pastor Dybel, I think many are afraid to look into this issue of the Trinity too much because they think that becoming non-Trinitarian would just be committing social suicide. And I know that you've endured some significant social consequences because of your change in theology. What were those consequences, and have they made you regret digging into and studying these biblical issues? Yeah, Dar, well, look, there is quite a backstory, you know, which I won't go into in detail. People can get that on a podcast I did with Sean Finnegan. But mm-hmm. look, really, I guess there were certainly some repercussions negatively for me. I've lost some friends. I've lost some respect in particularly Christian circles. I was excommunicated from the local Christian pastors network that I actually set up, established and ran. Our church was blacklisted and because I wanted to protect the unity of my church, I actually stepped down from my position as church planter and senior pastor, a church that I'd grown to, you know, a significant place over the previous 19 years. Then I unfortunately saw that church begin to slowly disintegrate, not so much over the doctrine, but really how it was all handled after I left. Mm. So, look, you know, I was isolated from my faith community. I was isolated from my denomination. I've seen family members, some of my family members suffer significantly because of it, either directly or through or by association. Yeah, look, there has been, you know, quite a fallout and, and, and negative uh, repercussions. But, look, I, I'd have to say, Dale, that any hurt or rejection or any of those negative consequences that I've suffered really pale into insignificance, you know, compared to what others have gone through that I know of uh, or even that I've read about. I guess uh, Michael Savitas comes to mind, uh, burned at the stake, you know, at the hand of Calvin. So, look, I've, I've never regretted the journey in spite of all of that. I mean, I'm really glad that I've, you know, sought to uphold the search for truth and I think to maintain my integrity and you just really can't put a price on that. And look, I'd have to, you know, say very clearly that God has been wonderfully good and wonderfully kind throughout the whole thing. Um, I just see myself as so blessed in many ways. Um, you know, I have a wife and family that are very supportive and I could just go on and on. But look, God has been good through it all and in it all. And I wouldn't, if I had my whole time over again, I wouldn't change a thing. You don't seem like the sort of bomb-throwing controversialist who just, you know, thrives on conflict and just wants to stir up the pot. You seem like a peacekeeping kind of person. Is that accurate? And did your writing this book have something to do with, you know, feeling a need to explain yourself after all of the church difficulties? Yeah, look, initially I did actually write it a bit cathartically Mm -hmm. uh, because there were members in my church that, you know, I didn't have a chance when I left to explain what I believed, why I believe it, Mm -hmm. believed that there were members coming, look, you know, we want to understand this a bit more. So I did write it, the book, I guess, to give some understanding and explanation to those people in my mind. But also I did want to have a more conciliatory approach in the sense that not to see people who disagree as our enemies. You know, we're all fellow Christians. We all share the same faith in Jesus as our Lord. So once again, going back to my heritage that had in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty or freedom, in all things love. And I wanted to uphold that. I think that's a great mantra because I do see this as a non-essential and I make that point in the last chapter of my book. And I'm saying to people, look, you know, let's sit down at the table. Let's try to generate, you know, more light rather than heat. Let's have truth and grace together. Let's have mutual respect. Let's have that desire for unity that Jesus prayed for and that Paul sought after. And in a spirit of unity, mutual respect, truth and grace, let's just, you know, have an open, respectful dialogue around these things. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And this brings us to an area of your book, Chapter 7, entitled What's Essential, where you've actually had some pushback from some of your fellow non-Trinitarian Christians. Why is that? Of all the bits of the book, this one has been, I guess, the one that's generated most difference of reaction or response. 
because some non-Trinitarians, they say for them that's the best part of the book because it's advocating, you know, sort of keeping the whole thing in perspective and having the right atmosphere in which to carry on the, the discussion. But I've had other non-Trinitarians that have reacted fairly negatively and they've said, you know, basically, look, you've kind of you've undermined your argument, you've made a great argument for understanding the scriptures in a, in a non-Trinitarian paradigm, but then you seem to be giving up ground that you've won by allowing others, you know, to maybe come to a different conclusion. And so they've pushed back and said, look, you know, you haven't gone hard enough and you need to close out the debate in a strong sort of way. And, and, and look, you know, I, I guess I'm resisting that. I'm just saying, hey, look, you know, I'm happy to make the case and to theologically in a very robust way uh, present my understanding, but allow others who might see it differently to come to their own conclusion, and yet we remain in good fellowship. And we don't have to see eye to eye in order to walk hand in hand, uh, because I do see it as a non-essential. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for some people that resonates really well, but I think for other people, they struggle with that stance. I guess some people wanted you to denounce Trinitarians in strong terms and say, well, who knows if they're really saved and mm. they're worshiping uh, an imaginary idol and things like this. Mm. But I mean, you, yeah. you didn't say anything like truth is relative or their case is just as strong as my case or to each his own different strokes for different. I mean, you didn't. You didn't say that it didn't matter or that, you know, there isn't a correct side and incorrect side or anything like that. Mm. It's interesting, you know, if scripture is going to set the standards as to what's essential, okay, but in the first century, there weren't any triune God people, (laughs) Mm. then there can't be a no triune God speculating clause in there, right? (laughs) Like. Trinitarians can look at John 17, 1 through 3, and say, oh, I think the Father is the one true God, is the only true God, and Jesus is the Son of God. And yet, somehow in their mind, that's consistent with God being the Trinity. But, you know, humans have this amazing ability to have inconsistent beliefs. Mm. What Trinitarians do with this is very strange. So... There is a tradition in the Athanasian Creed of saying that either you believe in the Trinity or you're going to hell. Most Christians don't agree with that, interestingly. Yes. So thoughtful evangelicals, maybe they'll notice that when they're counseling somebody who wants to be born again, they do not tell them anything about the Trinity or even about the Incarnation. They just Mm. tell them the basic kind of things you see preached in Acts. Mm. Okay, but then they they know that, oh, wait, this is supposed to be important. But I I can't say that if you don't believe in the Trinity, you're going to hell, because there's that eight-year-old kid who I just baptized, or a person who's not very smart and just can't keep it straight well enough, whatever. And you don't want to say that person's not saved, right? Mm -hmm. So then they, they say, all right, well, but you can't deny it, or you can't knowingly deny it. Or once you're informed, you can't deny it. So there's this no denying the Trinity clause that they've now added yep. to what's actually held up as essential in Scripture. Well, who said they could do that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But then some of these people were talking about severely criticizing you for not being hard enough on Trinitarians. They're saying, well, there's got to be no believing God as a Trinity clause. Well, wait a second. Why couldn't a born again person? based on the authority of their pastor and the last commentary they read, just also have on top of the required beliefs, this extra belief that uh, all three of them are God. Mm. Like, why would that disqualify them? Where is that written? It's not. Mm. Yeah. But it couldn't be because nobody back in that day, that wasn't an issue that existed in the first century. Mm. But who said we could add extra negative clauses like that? Yeah. Yes, and that's that's the thing. I mean, the basic statement of faith, you know, that, that Peter declares and, and is, is mentioned in all four Gospels, John's statement of purpose, as we've talked about, right through the book of Acts, the belief is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that, you know, we have salvation through him. 
And that's the core belief. And both Trinitarians and non-Trinitarians can affirm that core. I want to get back to the, the foundation and the basis that Jesus said he'd build his church on, you know, and I, I, I just want to emphasize that point, I guess, at the end of the book. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess that some people, they get a bit legalistic with their holiness standards, you know, like, surely you couldn't be a Christian and smoke cigarettes. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I've known some people like this. I think of somebody at my church right now who is most definitely a Christian and he smokes cigarettes. Not something I'd recommend, but we can't add stuff like that. But then how can we add these kind of doctrinal purity things? Like nobody thinks it's more important than me, you know. I spend so much time arguing about these things, but mm-hmm. I think we need to also have a, a view about how merciful God is on yeah. little limited creatures like us who get all kinds of things in our heads. Yeah, well, you know, Jesus was, it was said of Jesus, he was full of grace and truth. And I see Christians that tend to be one way very much or the other, you know, very strong on truth, but not on grace, or very strong on grace, but not on truth. And I think to hold those two together is a key. And I've tried to do that in the book. And I'm hoping that Christians generally will hold on to both truth and grace and hold them in together. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it comes through well in the book, and uh, I think it's going to help a lot of people be willing to revisit these things. It's not popular to do, but, you know, it wasn't popular in 1530 to question whether the Pope really had authority over all Christians. People are going to keep going back to the Bible and keep reforming. Yeah. And look, if I could just put a plug in for the book, Dale, I guess I've written it so that It is a a book that your average Christian believer who is non-Trinitarian can give to a Trinitarian friend, you know, because it's very accessible. The language and the whole approach means that it's, it's accessible to the average person, but also it's written in a tone that will hopefully be engaging rather than isolating. So, you know, it's, it's that sort of a book, hopefully, that will be a good introduction and one that people can give confidently to a, a Trinitarian friend, knowing it's not going to hopefully cause any great um, disruption to their, their relationship, but hopefully be a, a helpful means to an ongoing conversation. Yeah, if your friend wants you to read a Trinity book, go ahead and read it, and then tell yeah. them why you're not convinced, and then ask them to read Christ Before Creeds with you. It's not going to offend them or have any crazy cultish things in it. It's just somebody who's very Protestant trying to understand what the New Testament actually says. Yep, absolutely. At bare minimum, your Trinitarian friend should say, oh, okay, I I see what they're doing. I was assuming there was something crazy going on, but I see they're just trying to understand the New Testament, and maybe I don't agree with it, but... You know, just like if you're a, if you're a not crazy Calvinist, you can understand why there are Arminians and open theists, mm. and vice versa. Yeah. Well, thanks for talking with us, Pastor Dial. An absolute pleasure and privilege, and thank you, Dial, for your very positive and wonderful endorsement of the book, and I really appreciate. Yeah, you're more than welcome. You helped uh, in the process as well, just helping me work through some of the nuances of the theological statements that were in the book. And, and that was all so very helpful. So thank you. My pleasure. This week's thinking music has been the track Recreation by Airtone. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. We recently got a new review of the Trinity's podcast. It's by listener Dan Weatherall. He gives us five stars and writes, Super theological insight into the problems with Trinity doctrines and how the Bible presents a more compelling biblical Unitarian view. Discussions and interviews on things like whether God can die, what it means for Jesus to be tempted, and a history of the Trinity theories throughout the early centuries of Christianity always worth listening to for quality and up-to-date thought on these matters. Thank you, Dan. I'm really glad that you found these podcasts helpful. 
If you find them helpful, would you consider giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country or in whatever directory it is that you find podcasts? I'd really appreciate it, and it does help some people find the podcast. The site My Podcast Reviews gives us a global average rating of 4.7 out of 5. Not too shabby. That's 115 ratings, 55 reviews on three platforms in 13 countries. But you know what? We need to hear from you too. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Until next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.